As we now know, the earth is already too hot. So releasing any more emissions isn't going to solve the problem. We must mobilise at full speed to decarbonise our economy as fast as humanly possible. And that's what our next session sets out to investigate with the ever popular science writer and presenter and all round good guy, Bernie Hobbs. Please welcome Bernie. Thanks, Jane, and thanks everyone for coming to what promises to be a startling, alarming, hopeful, and um, no doubt a little bit of fun as well, view into the future. Um, before we begin, I would like to watch a parade of people walk across in front of me, and then I would like to um, acknowledge the traditional custodians of the land that we're meeting on here today, the Wurundjeri and Bunurong people of the Kulin Nation. I also want to acknowledge what a bloody fantastic job the Sustainable Living Festival has done in this its 20th year, instead of just going with the festival that we all know and love, stepping up in their own emergency response to hold this summit, which, as if you were here yesterday and already today, you know, has been just a phenomenal experience. Now, I'm wrapped to be here today with this panel who cover every aspect, pretty much, of Australian society and of our economy, and to bring you all with us on a journey into what I hope is the not too distant future. And that journey begins, I'm not sure if you were here yesterday, when Peter Garrett on this stage gave a speech that he suggested is the speech we need our political leaders to give. A, st a speech where we declared that Australia is moving in response to this climate emergency, is moving to an emergency response, is basically going on a war footing to tackle this climate emergency. The budget is going to be open, whatever is going to be necessary will be done. So for this next hour, we are, we are in that parallel future where the political will is there. There's bipartisan support here right now for tackling this carbon um, emissions problem. This is part one of two. So in this session, we are looking at what we can do to get to net zero emissions as fast as humanly possible. The political will is there, the budget is there, how are we going to get there, what, um, what technologies that exist right now can be brought out at scale right now, how long will it take, what will it achieve in terms of carbon re emission, emission reduction. So that's very simple challenge, I'm sure, for all of the big thinkers that we've got here on our panel today. It's a very diverse panel. Um, but these people, like many of you in the audience, have been in this space for so long and have thought and worked and researched and projected so hard into exactly what this will take. I'm really looking forward to hearing each of their case studies. So um, just barely, very quickly going across the panel from left to right, um, Thomas who does have a surname, is the... <laughs> Thomas King is the CEO. It's because you moved chairs and I learnt everything in the order that was written down. Uh, Thomas King um, is the CEO of Food Frontiers. So Thomas is going to be looking at food alternatives. I'm not allowed to say moving beyond meat. Um, oh, sorry. Uh, but looking at different protein sources and, uh, and how we can really smash our emissions down as fast as possible there. Um, Brendan Connor is the uh, the director of um, the, I'm going to look at your shirt because it's written there, the CAPE Sustainable Housing um, Project and has a very long history in this area. So he's looking at the residential side of things. What can our existing housing stock and the housing that we continue to build, how can we get that to zero emissions as fast as possible? Vanessa Petrie has the very easy job of being the CEO of Beyond Zero Emissions, which for more than a decade now has been the think tank that tackles all of these big questions really goes in and gives very um, thoroughly detailed uh, analyses of what it will take to get us. And Vanessa's going to take us on a little journey to uh, a coal area and that transition that needs to happen in that area, bringing people with. So 
that's going to be great to hear. Oliver Yates, if you were ever keen on getting money for, um, uh, for a renewable project, you will be familiar with Oliver, the former CEO of the Clean Energy Finance Corporation, um, now the long-term holiday, are just back from seven weeks skiing and partying with the fam, you know, so obviously all's well in Oliver's world. Now, Oliver is going to be tackling the, uh, the very... Um, interesting issue of hydrogen and ammonia and as much as I'm a chemist and love the idea of talking about that at length right now I'll let Oliver do it in 30 seconds a little later um, and Chow Nen Hen is the uh, the vice president of um, the Maonan group which is very much focused on large-scale solar and utility scale batteries so stationary energy so these are the things that we're covering and remember we are looking at political will is no longer an issue everything is out how fast can we get to zero emissions across these areas that is definitely enough from me from now we're going to hear from each of our five presenters and then we'll have a bit of a chat just to bring up some of those issues and then of course it's over to you so um get ready with your questions as soon as you can brendan up uh, Thomas King, I'm determined not to get your name right. Um, Thomas King, please take the stage and give it up for Thomas King, the CEO of Food Frontiers. Thank you, Bernie. Um, and this is such a fantastic event. I'm really pleased to be here. Uh, I have been a little concerned that food and agriculture as the greatest sources of emissions in Australia after the energy sector hasn't featured more heavily uh, in the conference because we ca cannot solve the climate crisis without transforming food and agriculture. Um, so I'm really pleased to, to be here to, to offer that perspective and speak not only to the solutions but also provide some background context and I'm going to try and blitz through this. So, I don't know where I'm pointing this. Globally, uh, the findings are there's been a range of peer-reviewed studies uh, that have stressed the urgent need to transform food and agriculture, particularly meat, and that's what I'm going to hone in on today. The UN's IPCC illustrated this last year, Oxford University the year before, Europe's foremost think tank Chatham House has stressed the same message. In terms of biodiversity, UNFAO says that 90% of ocean fish stocks are fully exploited or depleted. And the National Academy of Sciences revealed that farm poultry now make up 70% of the world's bird life and 60% of all mammals in our livestock. Last year, the Eat Lancet Commission was released. Uh, 30 world leading scientists worked for three years to determine what the planetary health diet would need to look like. And the Commission's co chair said that we require nothing less than a new global agricultural revolution. And this is what they found. On the, on the right hand side, you'll see the recommendations of the report. On the left, for comparison, is the current Western plate. More than 600% of the red meat and more than 200% of the poultry than what the findings recommend. The University of Oxford uh, and LCA Research Group also investigated how different food types stack up environmentally. And while all food types have some environmental impact, can I just wave my hand? Can you just go to the next slide, please? Um, they found that across over 38,000 farms in 119 countries, seven of the top 10 highest emitting foods are animal products, including red meat, pork, prawns, cheese, and poultry. They noted that most plant-based foods produce 10 to 50 times fewer greenhouse gas emissions than animal products, and that what you eat rather than where it's traveled from is far more important. Now, the message we often hear in Australia is that our agricultural systems are different, that the industry doesn't have the same uh, kind of impact. And while Australia's agricultural systems do differ in some ways to other continents, the overall footprint is strikingly similar. Next slide. The Department of Energy and Environment says that agriculture contributes up to 13% of Australia's total emissions. However, this calculation fails to include emissions from several points along the supply chain, including land cleared for grazing. A Beyond Zero uh, report using data from CSIRO, University of Sydney and aerial photography demonstrated that when land clearing is included, agriculture in fact accounts for 33% of Australia's total emissions, one third. Of the 13% of ag emissions that the government does track, 
a whopping 73% come from ruminants, cattle and sheep. Uh, and according to national inventory figures, 72% of all deforestation in Australia is for livestock grazing. So while essentially all forms of food production have some level of environmental impact, animal agriculture, our protein supply, represents the vast majority and is therefore in most urgent need of attention. Now, I want to be clear, this is not about demonising all forms of animal agriculture. This is not about, certainly not about pointing far fingers at uh, farmers. It's not about uh, proposing that the whole population all of a sudden go vegan. A multi-pronged plan is required with action from government, industry and consumers. And while research in some areas is still needed, from the best available data we have available, the way forward is crystal clear. Next slide. There are three high impact levers that we can pull, reduction, diversification, and rebalancing. So firstly, reduction. All of those recommendations from global authorities I mentioned earlier speak to the need for the West to eat less meat. Australians eat more than three times the global average of meat. And while it's encouraging that there is a rise in meat reducers and flexitarian consumers, the rate of reduction would increase sizably to meet aforementioned targets. Promisingly, new research from the University of Oxford found that choosing plant-based meals two-thirds of the time can cut your food-related emissions by nearly 60%. At the same time, we must diversify our protein supply with more options that aren't reliant on livestock and therefore use fewer resources. AgriFuture's recent report on proteins highlighted results from 52 life cycle analyses, concluding that even with large variants globally, plant protein foods always come out on top. Even meat alternatives, the products that are uh, designed to offer the taste and nutrition and convenience and functionality of the you know, sausages and dumplings that consumers demand, were found to have between 7.5 to 37 times lower emissions and between 9.25 and 84 times lower land use. Plus, they're usually made from pulses, which are nitrogen fixing crops that improve soil health and productivity. There are also biotech solutions uh, like fermentation and cultivating meat from cells, fields that uh, we're also working to accelerate at Food Frontier. Um, just next slide, just quickly. Uh, here's an example of the potential difference in environmental footprint of cell cultivated beef compared with conventional beef. This is the initial life cycle analyses that have been done. And jumping back to the previous slide, finally, there's rebalancing. We need to rebalance our use of resources to feed more people more sustainably and farm fewer animals in far more responsible ways. One example of current inefficiencies, can you please jump back to the previous slide, is the using of land and resources to grow crops to feed livestock instead of those grains and pulses feeding people directly. In Australia, nearly a quarter of the 42 million tonnes of grain that we produce is fed to livestock. There's also research into incremental reduction of livestock emissions, like using different grazing techniques uh, or feeding extracts or chemicals to cattle to try and inhibit methane production. Really important, but alone these improvements will not be enough, which is why the first two steps are as crucial. I'll leave it there and happy to take any questions. Thanks, Thomas. Now, Thomas did give us a heads up that he was going to go slightly over on his five minutes, but I feel like the fact that I got his name wrong twice gave him licence to add an extra minute there. So um, I'm, I'm determined to get everyone else's names right and we will all be sticking as, as closely as possible to our five minutes. Um, don't forget, farming and soil will certainly be raised in our partner session this afternoon at 3.20 right here where we're looking at, um, at uh, drawdown. Okay, so that'll definitely be getting a look in there as well, so make sure you stick around for that. Uh, our second speaker, Brendan Connor, um, is going to give us a taste, and I, and I should just say, so um, Thomas has painted the the scene, a lot of us are already familiar with it, it's good to hear those statistics, but what we're going to nail Thomas on afterwards is just how fast we can make that transition to these diverse protein sources and what impact that's going to have, what's it going to do to our carbon budget blowout, How's, how close to emission zero will get us. Um, Brendan, over to you please to talk us through a case study of um, zero emissions housing. Thank you very Brendan much. Connor. 
So yesterday was Valentine's Day and the theme was uh, Make Love Not Emissions and today is conscious uncoupling with uh, fossil fuels in the housing sector. <laughs> so um, how big is the housing sector? Well, it's around 12% of our, our uh, carbon footprint in terms of uh, detached uh, housing and also when you couple that with uh, com commuter vehicles, it's another 10%. Um, so around 22% coming from the housing sector. And the housing sector is also very climate vulnerable because we've built, built a lot of housing stocks that aren't very well suited to, uh, to, to heat waves. So what we set out to do was to build the CAPE, which is a climate adapted zero emission housing estate near Phillip Island. We trained our local builders, we pulled together some ethical investors, we wrote design guidelines and we raised the bar to build seven and a half star housing that was efficient all electric, solar powered, uh, gas free. We train those builders with energy efficiency experts and what's the result? The result is that we're averaging over eight star energy efficiency and we're uh, across the estate which is a national first. And RMIT uh, just done a study on the Cape and I might just go like that to change the slide because this isn't working. And what they found is that the Cape uh, is uh, using 88% less energy uh, than a conventional gas electric six star housing estate. So we're talking about megawatts, not megawatts. Megawatts are the megawatts we never had to produce in the first place by harnessing energy efficiency. Um, the other thing is that uh, by decoupling with fossil fuels, we're zeroing, uh, pulling bills down less than $500 a year, and many uh, householders are zeroing their bills, which is significant compared to two and a half to $3,000 energy bills for the average Australian household. Uh, the homes are thermally comfortable, sitting between 18 and 25 degrees, including during heat waves, and the whole estate is uh, generating three to four times as much energy as it's using through that, that combination of approaches. So it's actually a clean energy power station that's shunting clean electrons across into the old legacy stock uh, in, next door to us. We're on track to save half a million per annum in avoided energy spend uh, per year, and we're aiming for a stretch target of eliminating half a million dollars in avoided petrol spend per annum as well. So a million dollars a year saving, staying in the pockets of that 230 household estate by eliminating fossil fuels using technologies that exist today passive solar design and, and solar power. So here's a, a couple of graphs. Uh, the one on the top, uh, the, the top right is a, an energy profile from one of the houses. The light pink is the amount of energy it's producing. The dark red on the left is how much it's exporting and the, the little red is uh, how much it's actually using. So this is one of the houses in big energy surplus. Uh, the graph to the bottom the bottom left is the thermal comfort zone of the house. So you can see that, that, uh, that line during the centre. That's showing that the house is staying uh, between 18 and 25 degrees year round. And the spiking uh, lines on the other side are the outside temperatures. So you can see these houses sitting beautifully thermally comfortable. And on the top there, that's an efficient all electric house geared with a, a long range electric vehicle. And these are the sorts of texts that I'm getting from our residents. Here's my energy bill, minus $120 for winter. Here's my energy bill, it's minus $150, including charging my electric vehicle. And this is what you, what you can achieve using today's technologies. Um, so we did a whole lot of training. We're validating our builds by doing blower door tests, and we're doing a whole lot of work with the industry. So the top, the top left photo is working with developers down in the, uh, the Geelong area. We're having uh, a lot of interest from the development industry, uh, community groups, and so on. And, we're handing the baton out to our residents who are uh, taking it further with all the biodiversity restoration on site, uh, urban habitat, insect hotels, and we've got a thriving community garden for local food production. And that's all fantastic, but we really need to upscale that across the whole industry. And to do that, we need to push to seven star minimum, seven and a half star across uh, the housing industry. We are seeing development starting to go gas free. We can easily eliminate gas use and huge amounts of expense in our estates through using technologies. And from my point of view, I think we can step up now from ethical developers through to the water authorities. We'll be the next ones with surplus land. We just need a few 500 or 1,000 lot subdivisions to be hitting these standards and, and then it'll very quickly mainstream. And then I think you'll start to see progressive developers and then the industry will follow. Uh, and the economic benefits are in the tens of billions over, over coming decades by, by uh, using this approach. So, and then just finally, um, 
I work in the field of biological carbon as well, and I see that to correct climate change, uh, we're going to need to do a whole lot of drawdown. There's a whole lot of technologies and approaches and methodologies coming through across oceans and soil and uh, sinking carbon in building stocks, innovative building products. But we need frameworks to rapidly innovate and war game um, and fund these solutions. So this is what's, what's missing. Uh, there's a group called CIRCA, Centre for Innovation in Recovery Climate, a group of scientists now working to pull and um, support a lot of this innovation. But in my view, we also need a climate recovery authority, which is, uh, very, uh, has a lot of funding, and it pulls and, and turbocharges a lot of this innovation in drawdown. Thank you very much. And as I mentioned, that drawdown is the focus of our entire other um, panel discussion this afternoon, hosted by uh, my colleague ABC's Natasha Mitchell, right here at 3.20 this afternoon. So you do not want to miss that. Clearly, our panel are all going to be here watching it as well. Um, now, so Brendan, again, has taken us to the cutting edge in residential space. What we need to know next is how far that can go across Australia, how quickly it can be rolled out, what are the other stumbling blocks and what impact it's going to make. But let's get to Vanessa Petrie. So Vanessa's a former engineer, the CEO, as I said, of Beyond Zero Emissions. And Vanessa's going to take us um, to one of the places that I guess is a bit of a... Um, uh, what do you call those really sensitive things that on which, whatever, um, <laughs> to one of those places, a touchstone, I guess, for the movement towards renewables and the movement towards zero emissions, and that's a coal community. Uh, Vanessa's looking at um, uh, what can be done if you tackle it the right way to take an entire coal industry and community with you to become a successful renewable sector. So join me in welcoming Vanessa Petrie, CEO of Beyond Zero. Thank you. Um, I'd like to acknowledge um, that we're meeting on the lands of the Wurundjeri people and I pay my respects to their elders past, present and future and my respects to um, other elders that are with us today. Bernie asked, uh, just how fast can we decarbonise? And of course the answer is 10 years or even less. La yes, thank you. Away the end of the game, or halfway through the story, but yeah, I'll let it. Start. I'm the kind of person that likes to read the end of a novel before <laughs> I start because I don't like suspense. So in November last year, we launched Collie at the Crossroads, planning a future beyond coal. And in the exec summary, we we write: for Collie to prosper, a grand coalition must be formed, which works to secure the town's future in the interests of the community, workers and the planet. And of course, this is true for Australia at large. We need a grand coalition. So beyond zero emissions for more than 10 years, we have 16 um, reports that show that technology is available right now. But if we keep going down the binary path we've been going on, where it's a choice of this or that, us against them, we're going to spin our wheels um, and we just don't have time for that. So we, um, we were very fortunate to uh, have some funding to do some work in southwest Western Australia last year, and we thought our job was showing how to convert a coal town to renewables. Um, but my colleague went there, when he went there a year ago, he sat at the bar with a coal worker who said to him, oh, well, welcome to Collie. We're the most toxic town, second toxic town in Australia. And that was really the beginning um, of a really big learning year for us, that you need to meet people where they are. And when we're looking at how we deploy solutions, we need to have, um, we need to have at the center of that no one left behind. So we worked to create a vision for Collie of 9,000 people, 1,300 working in the coal sector for you know, almost 100 years have helped build the economy of Western Australia, um, really important town and a very vital role. And the big fear is, well, what comes next? The writing's on the wall for the coal industry in, in um, Collie. So with the help of some wonderful um, you know, partners in WA, Climate Justice Union and Sustainable Energy Now, we worked with the community, all four unions. Um, we worked with the Wilman people um, and we worked with the council and we looked at how can we use zero carbon industries to build new thriving industries that use what Collie has, skilled workers, infrastructure, um, 
a good strategic location for you know, transport and exports, how do you retool what you have there so no one is left behind? And what we found was um, with the right combination, you can grow th new industries that would create over 1,700 jobs, high quality manufacturing jobs, which more than offsets the 1,300 jobs that are currently in coal. So you can read the vision on our website, but um, you know, at, at the heart of it was a renewable energy transition industry where you can make the parts of the infrastructure that's going to be needed um, for the deployment, sustainable building materials like um, geopolymer, cement, um, creating engineered wood products, recycling steel using an electric arc furnace and renewable energy. And we looked at, um, you know, Kali has the potential of being a, a, a national leader in a recycling renewable technology hub because, of course, if we're going to have deployment at speed um, of renewable infrastructure, we also need to do the work now around how we maximise the materials um, and recycle the end of life and use them again. And we also looked at what does it take to roll this out and the really important message is that state and federal governments, they already have the policy tools needed to drive rapid deployment of technology that we know is proven um, and works right now. So, you know, um, it's first and foremost, we have to secure a social licence within the community and that means that understanding where the community is, their vision, the future they want um, and supporting them all the time to get there. We need to make sure everyone benefits from the transition and again that no one is left behind. We need to legislate for very ambitious targets. So. We put forward that if you legislate in um, Western Australia for 100% by 2030, that ambition and policy certainty is what will drive investment, um, rapid investment and deployment um, of these new, clean, sustainable industries um, in the heart of Collie. You can maximise local participation, um, so putting in targets for buying local, it's a very, it's a, it's a policy tool we, we know how to use and understand. Um, implementing, you know, low building, low carbon, um, requirements in major projects, um, having a sustainable industry investment fund to help incentivise, most importantly, taking away the subsidies that's currently provided to the fossil fuel industry and other boom-bust um, industries and reallocating that to the deployment of these technologies. So we, we have the solutions we need, we have the policy tools we need. Um, looking at Kali, we have a highly skilled, um, you know, manufacturing workers and a community around that, um, you know, we, we have the infrastructure we need, we have the wind and the sun, and it's, we also have the right regulatory, you know, it's a good place to do business in Australia, it's secure and it's stable. But the most important thing to package it all up again is we all need to be on the same page. We have to. We have to come together. There is no time left um, for, for not coming together and building that grand coalition. So before I joined Beyond Zero Emissions, I was a public servant for many, many years. And the biggest thing I have learnt, um, and it's been a joy to learn, is that I think we underestimate the capacity of ourselves and each other and the community to be ambitious and to think big and to have the courage to pursue, you know, huge, um, huge ideas. And, you know, we need to acknowledge that Australians, like, we are a wonderful community that can do that. But we need, it's all about people. We need to come together around ambition and hope and we've got to get moving. Thank you. Thanks, Vanessa. Um, Oliver Yates, I predict, will be the first person today to stick to his allotted five minutes. I've been wrong before, but... Uh, <laughs> um, Oliver, background in finance and in particular in sustainability and finance, um, but today you're going to take us... Uh, to draw a picture... No, come, keep moving. Um, of the hydrogen economy, I guess, is the safest thing to say, different aspects to it, and how that could really help um, cut our emissions to zero. Great. Thank Thanks, you, everybody. Um, let's, uh, let's move on now. Now, um, in terms of the topic, there is no time to lose. And if we are to um, make this energy ch challenge and transition work, we've got to make the obvious leap forward. Unfortunately, it's kind of like the obvious leap forward into what I would call is the, the great already known. I want to achieve a few things in the time that we have. I want you to understand why hydrogen production is vital to the future 
of our renewable energy industry and the growth of that industry. I want you to leave confident here today that we can decarbonise the economy cheaply and efficiently using existing technology. I want you to understand how hydrogen production works to stabilise the grid. And I want you to realise that whilst hydrogen is a key to rapid decarbonisation, a key is no good without a door. And it is ammonia which is that door that people need to realise when they're talking about hydrogen. Next slide, please. Um, renewables and batteries, they provide part of the solution, but we do face a de desperate challenge, how to decarbonise all the other sectors of our economy, such as heavy transport, industry and ag. Now, with both the key being hydrogen and the door being ammonia, we can solve all of that. Heavy transport and shipping, solved. Export of renewable energy, solved. Plastics, chemicals, gas replacement, all solved. Mineral refining, all solved. It also provides, at the same time, grid stability benefits. It underwrites future, future renewable energy uh, production, and it provides storage and generation all in one hit. Next slide, thanks. Now, I didn't uh, study uh, anything like this at university. I'm just a boring banker, and I'm not a scientist. But um, H is where the energy is. That's the hydrogen. That's the power. You make it simply by splitting water with renewable energy. The problem with hydrogen, it's a very light gas. It's difficult to compress, so storing it and moving it remains a major, major problem. However, hydrogen is a sexy little animal. It bonds very well with nitrogen. 80% of this atmosphere is made of, uh, of nitrogen. You can suck it out easily with an air separator. You introduce it to hydrogen and bango, three molecules of uh, hydrogen attached to your nitrogen, and you've got ammonia. Importantly, ammonia carries more hydrogen in a liquid form than even liquefied hydrogen. So you talk about people, these liquefied ships, if you want to move hydrogen from one place to another, you're better to make it into ammonia in Australia, ship it in ammonia form and split it at the other end because you'll carry more hydrogen than you would if you use liquefied hydrogen. It's also very easy when you take ammonia to the other side of the world to split it back again to hydrogen. They come together, a bit like a marriage, you can bust them pretty quickly when you want them and put them under pressure. Next slide, thanks. Um, the electrolysis system is all old technology. It's been done for years. Importantly, with electrolysis, you can turn it on and off rapidly. Therefore, it's an ideal match for renewables. So just like the aluminium industry was a perfect match for our always-on coal-fired power plants, making hydrogen, in particular, and then ammonia, is a perfect match for the variable renewables that we have coming into our system. Turning on rapidly, turning on and off, it can be used like a battery, battery and it can stabilise the grid. Next slide, if I could. Um, many, many uses. So people talk about hydrogen again, but they often miss the point. Um, again, this issue of hydrogen being a light gas, difficult to liquefy, difficult to store, virtually very, very complicated to, uh, to transport, all solved when you, get to, uh, to when you get to ammonia. Ammonia is easy to make, it's a liquid, we ship it around the world, it's one of the most traded commodities. It's very easy to get into this market and already start this transition. The market already exists for ammonia. You can't actually enter into long-term contracts for the supply of hydrogen. You can enter into long-term global contracts for the supply of ammonia. So we could do exactly like we did in the electricity industry and just say to the dirty ammonia market that you have to have 20% green ammonia in your system and we can start priming the system now. We can repeat what we've done in the energy industry and now start to do it in the chemical and refining and the steel sector. So ammonia, importantly, can also be burnt directly. It can be blended into existing coal fire fleets, and that's what they're talking about in Japan. In Japan, is already expecting to start blending ammonia into their coal fire fleet so they can start to reduce emissions right across their whole fleet now, introducing a clean fuel. Next slide, and uh, finally, um, so that all said, so the ammonia is actually a very fast lane to the energy transition. Ammonia is a heavily used global product. It's heavily carbon intensive, and we can start to reduce that now. Producing hydrogen and ammonia is highly complementary to a renewable energy market. It is the door which balances the grid. Ammonia holds more hydrogen than liquefied hydrogen itself. It enables you to export renewables across the, the world. We've been handling, transporting, and moving ammonia for years. We know how to do it. We don't know how to do it easily with hydrogen. We can burn ammonia directly in our existing coal fleet, so we can start decarbonising the economy now. We can use it in all our ships now. 
and we can make Australia a major exporter of renewables now through this process so we can deliver more jobs to Australia and ensure that we remain an energy exporting company, country. Ammonia is the door to rapid energy transformation and we can start that process right now. Final slide. So Arena was right a while ago. They've put this out. Uh, renewable and the production of renewable chemicals is an export opportunity for Australia. It's also the rapid transition opportunity that we need to get on right now with existing technologies and it's right in front of us and we can do it. Thank you. Great. Chow, how are you feeling? Are you up for the challenge? Five minutes? Yeah, no one's managed it yet, but I have great faith. Uh, Chow Han Nan from um, Mountain uh, Energy Group. Thank you. Thanks very much, Bernie. Um, look, I want to start with a story about how and why we started doing renewables and what we've been doing in the last 10 years and what we want to do in the future and sort of how all of this ties together um, based on what the problems that we're seeing. So we... I'm actually a civil engineer. Um, I'm part of the, uh, ten, 10 years ago, I was part of like building highways and you know, all those kind of stuff that pollute the environment. And it was only through spending a lot of time working um, on site, uh, spending a lot of time with farmers and landowners, did I, did I build some compassion towards the environment. And, and it was only through that experience that I actually start making a big change in, into uh, building renewable energy systems. Um, about 10 years ago, um, I joined forces with a, with a high school friend of mine and uh, we started this company um, with, with a dream to build a lot of large-scale solar farms in Australia at a time when there was a lot of political uncertainty. Um, we knew the odds were against us, but we did it anyway. Um, and it was only because there was, there was one state government, it was the ACT government, that had, that had a very ambitious dream of becoming 100% renewables, and, and we saw that as a massive opportunity, a big stepping stone um, to give us the opportunity to get into this industry. In 2012, we were, we were one of the successful uh, proponents um, of the ACT uh, uh, reverse auction, uh, solar po auction process, and so was Oliver as well, and, and uh, you know, it's a very small world where you have, you have a very small number of people trying to you know, make a big difference in this very challenging environment, but you know, as long as you have the will, you, you can really achieve that based on our experience. Um, over these years, we've, we've already built uh, two large-scale solar farms, one in Canberra, mm. which is enough to um, power approximately 2,000 households, and uh, more recently, we've completed one in uh, Bow Ranald, which is just on the border of Victoria and New South Wales. Um, that's, that's big enough to power about 50,000 households. Um, next slide, please. So this is just a, 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 a video fly-through of the most recent solar farm which we built. Um, the journey along this process has been challenging in uh, various ways, uh, starting with the lack of uh, uh, local expertise at the time 10 years ago. Um, the technology was mainly imported from overseas. Uh, a lot of the local contractors were still learning how to do a lot of these things, and, and I believe um, the, the environment is much, much more different now. We don't have an excuse about the technology. We don't have an excuse about how you can do these things. Um, if anything, we, 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 we should be able to get these things done uh, a lot quicker and a lot cheaper. Um, next slide, please. What we've, what we've recently started doing is uh, energy storage projects. And the reason for that is because of a lot of the uh, network and grid issues that we've been seeing in the market. Um, uh, mo most notably, we're seeing issues um, in areas where there are high renewable energy, high numbers of renewable energy projects trying to get connected into the grid for which the grid was actually not built for this kind of technology um, you know, once upon a time. And uh, it's a huge process to actually transition and uh, change the way the transmission and the grid needs to be uh, built and, and augmented to account for what could be a 100% renewable energy future. Now, we see that energy storage um, is, is, is one of the many ways in which we can facilitate this renewable energy trans transition and uh, we started developing a large portfolio 
of energy storage projects, both in New South Wales and in Victoria. Um, and uh, next slide, please. What we, one of the biggest issues with the grid at the moment has caused a lot of investment uncertainty. And this investment uncertainty is, is, is going to affect all of us because Undoubtedly, um, our, our superannuation funds are going to be investing into um, the big banks, and the big banks are reinvesting our money into construction companies, ASX-listed companies, as well as these institutional investors who have sunk billions of dollars mm -hmm. into assets that could potentially be stranded, that could potentially be curtailed, and that could potentially affect the confidence in investing into further projects. Mm -hmm. And this is something that we are strongly focused on uh, addressing. So, thank you very much. <laughs> I will take those three spare seconds you left at the end and use them. Thanks very much, Chow. Um, now, we do have a very short time here for us to just clarify a few things and hammer home a few points. We've seen some great... Um, uh, visions, I guess, for, for what could be done, what we've already got the technology to do. Um, Vanessa already gave us the spoiler of 10 years as how long it takes to fully transit Australia's economy to renewables. But what about, or I beg your pardon, to zero emissions. What about the individual sectors? Now, Oliver, if I can start with you, the hydrogen ammonia picture that you painted. How far away, if we just open the purse strings right now, the political will is there, how long would it take to get an industry of up to scale um, that you're envisaging? How long is that going to be? Well, actually, the biggest um, barrier is probably going to be the ability to get renewable energy to the market because one of the biggest delays seems to be transmission upgrades and we have brilliant renewable energy resources across Australia, um, but if we can't bring them to market, we can't convert them into other products. And whilst people know you can build a 600 megawatt solar farm probably in 18 or 24 months, to run a 100 kilometre cable, uh, you'll be in a permit process for probably six years or 10 years. So we do have a real, uh, we have real barriers to enabling us to, to make this transition if we don't get on with it. And um, so uh, we need to get running. We need so to put those roadblocks down. Is 10 years, if we get started now, is 10 years your answer there? Uh, look, the, the, uh, realistically, um, given the, if, if history was to repeat itself, you will not get anywhere near this transition in 10 years. Mm. It has to change. The speed of transition needs to change. So is it possible to get it then? Uh, if, if the will of the people, uh, yes, it could be. If you had a government which was enabling uh, this type of investment to happen, then you could. Okay. So, Sarah, uh, Vanessa, I see you... Um, so we, last year, um, we, we figured out how the Northern Territory could grow 8,000 new jobs and, you know, $2 billion worth of new, renew, new revenue off the back of a massive renewable energy deployment to create new industries. And, you know, the Northern Territory, they have a lot of pride in their gas industry. It's a huge, complex, expensive, um, massive engineering feat that they have pulled off in under 10 years. So if they can do that with gas, we can do it with renewables and clean tech if we want to. Um, they got over those barriers for fossil fuel deployment um, incredibly quickly. So of course we can do it for the alternative, um, the renewables. Great. Um, Chow, your uh, vision for getting solar farms, large scale solar farms and utility scale battery systems happening, how long until they are at scale to do their part in cutting our carbon emissions? Um, to zero. <laughs> look, uh, if we could build everything, we should start building tomorrow and it would take probably less than two years to get everything built. But the reality of the matter, as already discussed, is the transmission issues, which will mm -hmm. take many, many years, but perhaps even decades to build. So the only real immediate solution is probably just to build a lot of energy storage systems or a lot of ways to regulate the energy that's actually produced by renewable energy. So it's not just about building in um, building for the location, like really decentralising and, and not relying so much on the longest um, distance transmission? It is about building transmission. It is about regulating and controlling and dispatching the energy as and when required. And it's also about understanding what are the areas that actually need the energy in a more transparent way. And that's the only way which you're able to quickly build everything, assuming there are no political issues. Righto. Brendan? Uh, you've 
done a tremendous job with your team in a single, um, a single development there. You've said you're looking to water corporations and other places with large land plots. How much of an impact could you really make to our housing emissions with new developments like this, even seven and a half star ones? How big an impact? So, look, it could very quickly mainstream to build energy positive zero carbon housing estates. Uh, we have the small boutique developers doing it like us. Uh, I think the next cab off the rank would be water authorities who are doing large developments who have tr sort of triple bottom line approaches. And then, um, you know, progressive developers doing this. We just need a few thousand lotters and then I think uh, we can change that whole industry. We need to hit seven star, uh, seven star plus and efficient all electric and solar and then do some grid uh, you know, battery nodes and, and smart grid management, and we can, we can do this in, in housing. Uh, the problem is legacy stock. So new housing estates like ours can be power stations that power existing suburbs. They can be more than net neutral. They can be part of the solution. And then you've got retrofitting existing stocks. There's groups like My Efficient Electric Home on Facebook with 12,000 members, and they've got great examples of all the steps you can take to retrofit even the mansion-type stock. Uh, so, look, it's absolutely doable uh, within 10 years and within, within a few years, really. Within yeah. a few years? Yeah, to retrofit and then swap the industry, absolutely. If the political will is there and, um, and if we get, get uptake in the industry. And so housing, did you say 10% of our... Uh, yeah, around 12%, 12%. And, then, and then there's commuter, ve commuter vehicles which are around 10%, so that's about electrification of transport, electric bikes, um, and you can have energy uh, positive estates that can also provide that energy budget for electric vehicles, and really I, I think we're going to see uh, in the next 10 years a, a massive uptake of electric vehicles. We don't have enabling, enabling policies here uh, and frameworks, but uh, you know, market forces are going to drive that, but we need enabling frameworks to accelerate up, uptake of electrification of, of transport as well. Thanks. And Thomas, uh, the change in farming to, mm. uh, to give us these newer sources of protein so we're not relying so much on livestock. Yeah, well, it's, look, food and agriculture is a really complex one um, and to know how to address a problem, you need to understand that problem and there is still, it's still a dearth of data in an Australian context around this topic. Um, as I went through in my presentation, the data that we do have available points very clearly to protein supply being the biggest contributor to food and ag emissions and that there are multiple solutions needed to addressing that challenge. One is reduction in meat consumption, so that's um, the responsibility of consumers. The other is uh, offering more options for people to make that uh, choice, that alternative choice easier, which could be just eating more fruit and veg, it could be eating meat alternatives, it could be biotech uh, solutions. And then there's the rebalancing on the agricultural front, and that's the responsibility of the agriculture sector and the various IDCs and, and you know, red meat industry bodies, etc. cetera. Um, and there is a target on their behalf to be carbon neutral by 2030. Um, there's very, very little information online about how on earth they're going to reach that target, uh, but most of the solutions are about uh, trying to sequester carbon so that they're balancing out uh, emissions. On the reduction and diversification front, Consumers are starting to get it. One in three Australians are now in the meat reducer or flexitarian bucket, and we've seen in the last 18 months more and more retailers and businesses respond by expanding their plant-based offerings, which is really exciting. So the commercial space, investors, businesses, food providers are getting it. Um, the political side, it, it's a different story. Um, and in fact, we've seen parties like the Nationals actually try and push for um, legislation and regulation that would restrict um, the growth of these new protein sectors rather than saying, how can we actually help our constituents participate in industries of the future rather than trying to label them as a problem that should be feared and fought? Okay, uh, were you busting to say something there? Yeah, there's a microphone, there's two microphones, so... so I, I might just, one, one thing in relation to the timing of this, tra this transition, because I can hear this question of, you know, can we do this in 10 years, right? And I think it's important to realise is, is what we're talking about, and we may slightly be talking about different things. When you hear Finkel or myself talking about we need... Like Finkel did his numbers basically saying if Australia was going to go carbon neutral and we were going to export the same amount of power just in gas form to Asia, because you can't just turn these people off, they actually need it, and we're going to export the same amount of power to them as what we are doing today, that's no growth, what do we need in renewables? And it was 800%. Right? That's 40 times what we have today. And that is the type of challenge that I see when I talk about 100% renewables. 
I talk about 100% renewables in relation to us and our neighbouring countries, and that is the reason why transmission and the growth and investment that we need now, we really need to get on with it. There is no wasted transmission. We need to stretch out into these areas and tap these renewable energy resources because we need 800% renewables if we're just to deliver the power that we're currently delivering now in a fossil fuel form. And what are the hurdles to that transmission change? A government actually understanding the opportunity that is obviously presented in front of us. Our regulators make their rules about transmission investment based upon a government program which tells you you're going to have 26 to 28 per cent carbon reductions in the domestic economy, ignoring what business and science is telling you is going to happen. So as business people, we see this opportunity and we see our regulators holding investment back. We can't tap renewable energy resources. You know, the, the, the renewable plants at the moment are being constrained. People have built facilities to produce clean power. They cannot now get it to market. That's how ridiculous we are at the moment. You've got plants that are just sitting there, underutilised, constrained off the grid. Does anyone want to add to the other, <laughs> other shortcomings? No? Brendan, are you? Yeah. And I also just think we need to refocus on energy efficiency, the megawatts, the megawatts we never needed to produce through harnessing leading energy efficiency. And in the housing sector, we need a big energy efficiency drive across legacy stock. So there's a whole lot of retrofitting and um, improvements that need to be made to drive energy efficiency, which is often not, not mentioned as, as a big opportunity as well. Okay. Um, we're ready to go to questions, so start shooting your questions through on your, uh, and here we go with our first one. Um, how do we address consumer concerns about health and reducing meat? Thomas. I'm assuming that question is regarding the perception that eating less meat might have negative health implications, you think? Uh, is that the consumer? Well, uh, potentially. Consumer. I mean, there's, there's. Um, so, oh. so if we look at the Eat Lancet Commission as, in, as an example, this report that I referred to before, 30 world leading scientists, led by Dr. Walter Willett, the most cited nutritionist in the world, literally the top of his field, one of the top five most cited medical professionals in the world. That plate that they came up with, that was sitting on um, the right of the screen was the goal that they said to be able to feed the world healthfully, delivering nutritional needs within planetary boundaries. And meat and dairy were still on that plate, but they had a much, much smaller representation compared with plant proteins and just fruit and veg. So if people are worried they can't get their protein or it's bad for their health to cut meat? I'd like to think that we've dispelled those myths already, that there are enough people meat-free walking around that aren't dead. Um, but there's a, a plethora, absolute plethora of peer-reviewed studies over recent decades that speak to the benefits of a, if not plant-based, but plant-centric diet. Eating more fruit and veg is good for us. You don't have to eliminate meat entirely, um, but, but yeah, it's... And, and I would say, like with everything, the um, bringing everyone along with us is, um, is part of the key, not... 100%, and meeting consumers where they're at. One of the concerning things from some of the recommendations, like the ones in the Eat Lancet Commission, is that they painted this really vivid challenge in terms of protein supply. But do you know what their solution was to this? We need to get the world to eat more beans and nuts and grains and tofu. And that ignores the complex social, cultural and economic factors that underpin people's choice to eat meat, or in developing and middle-income countries' desire to uh, eat more of it into the future. So why do people eat meat? not because of how it's produced, they did in spite of that. It's the end product, it's the taste, the cultural significance, the convenience. And so if we can offer that, and this is what's being done in alternative proteins by either replicating meat products from plants or harvesting them from cells, we can give people what they want in terms of taste and functionality and familiarity with a fraction of the impacts. And that's what we're doing at Food Frontier in Australia and New Zealand. Uh, and along that line of, um, of looking, doing it in a socially fair... Oh, here we go, sorry. <laughs> the questions are flashing up and disappearing. OK. How do we manage the transition cost transferred from corporations to consumers? I'm not a business person. Is that...? Well, uh, 
Look, I'm happy to answer that, but I think in a lot of cases is that the more and more we do this, the more and more we're seeing that the transition cost is not a cost, it's actually saving. What is saving. transition cost, sorry? Yeah, transition is cost, cost is basically if we're going to suddenly replace our coal-fired power stations with alternatives, is there a cost, right? right? And the cost often people say, okay, it's a massive you know, employment cost. Let's take that as the minimum. But as I've just pointed out, the amount that we need to build from renewables and transmission and, uh, is enormous. I mean, when you construct stuff, you need a hell of a lot more people than when you operate stuff. We are going into a construct stuff stage in Australia. This transition leads with construct stuff. The biggest concern that I have is that actually we'll be short mm. workers. In fact, that will be the thing that could hold us back. And it is amazing that, again, people look at this completely blindly and think, I'm going to lose jobs. They don't realise this construct stuff issue means that we're going to need a hell of a lot more people working than, than what people envisage. So, yes, the transition cost is real. Um, but, but the transition opportunity is much better. I mean, when you're not paying, we're paying 40 billion a year overseas for petrol, right? That 40 billion, if they were electric cars, would be going into renewable energy facilities that were built in Australia coming from our sun. That's 40 billion dollars a year that circulates in our economy to our workers. And we're worried about the transition cost. It's incredible. We're pouring more money offshore than you can imagine and we can keep it here in our own country and grow our own jobs and our own economy. Gee, you should run for federal politics, Oliver. <laughs> what a great idea. Um, probably our last question, can you speak to the tension between food security and regenerative ag? I, I might leave most of that to the panel later this afternoon because I'm not an agricultural expert or an agronomist. Um, I have focused on environmental and food systems change for a decade, though. Um, the, In this, that case, this, let's go to the next okay. question. Um, can we produce enough food this way? Well, it kind of speaks to the regenerative agriculture point. Regenerative agriculture, like the other um, points that I put up on that slide, is part of the solution. Um, and it is one way for us to uh, reduce or mitigate the emissions from agriculture. But what uh, has been shown is there's, there's big limitations. Um, we cannot use regenerative grazing techniques to meet current, let alone future meat demand. And so meat uh, demand must reduce. And where we do still farm animals, how can we do it in more responsible ways? And so, yeah, I'll, I'll leave that to the discussion later this afternoon. Okay, now that discussion is coming up right here at 3.20, um, hosted by Natasha Mitchell. Don't miss that. But before we wrap here, I just want to be very clear, we can be at net zero emissions minimum in 10 years. Aspects of the journey there can be completed in well less than 10 years. Um, the grid upgrade is going to be one of the blocks that really um, is hampering our efforts to get there. Um, hopefully we can manage that in, um, you know, Churchillian um, strides and, and get it happening well before you would expect. If all of things, if, if we have the political will and we have the purse strings open, is there anything else we need to worry about or have we got this thing under control? Quick, yeah? yeah? There's one right there. Oh, sorry. Yeah, look, you don't really have it under control unless you actually engage, get an international engagement. To be honest, we all operate in a competitive economy. Um, we cannot have a different cost structure to the rest of the world. We need to be outward leaning and encourage. Remember, it's in Australia's best interest that everyone goes renewables because we've got the best renewable energy resources. All our neighbours have a lot less than what we do. Um, but we need all of our neighbouring countries and others to also come on the same journey because we are competing both in imports and exports. Quick, Brennan. And on the other side of the ledger, leading into the other session, we need a um, rapid innovation, proliferation of carbon negative technologies and frameworks to, to manage that, because we can decarbonise, but we're already too hot, so it's dealing with the legacy carbon. Good luck in the afternoon session. <laughs> uh, very if anyone quickly. wants to learn more about alternative proteins, foodfrontier.org. Great, fantastic. Join me in thanking our tremendous panel for giving their time today painting a picture that it is doable
we need the political will, we need the, the political finance, and we need the, uh, the grid. So that's what's required. Enjoy the rest of your afternoon and see you back here at 3.20. Thank you.